I guess, since we didn't seem to have finished the topic, <laughs> as far as the Lord's concerned, that I better put a coat on. I'm getting a little chilly. One of the things I like about having the opportunity to do videos or video devotionals is that they aren't specifically done only for, say, you. <laughs> or, if you want to put it bluntly, they aren't recorded for you to learn a lot from, but they're recorded, and this is why I started it in the first place, was to make me do my devotionals every day like I should. And then, you get the opportunity to participate in that cooperative joining, so to speak, of learning that both of us share in when we do our devotionals daily. I, I know I've been contacted many times recently about people recording their own videos, and I've told them, do! Because you see, how a person interrelates or reacts to God is personal. How God may speak to you could be completely different than how he may speak to me. But when you share it with me, then I begin to allow the Holy Spirit to tickle my ear, to make me listen and pay attention to what you have to say. Because then he can take those words and make them applicable to me. The same thing is true as I share my devotions with you. He can take the words that are spoken and make them applicable to you. The way we understand that is that we're told that the Holy Spirit himself, as God, takes our prayers and he literally, in heaven, very physically, but very literally, intercedes and changes our words into what he groans and intercedes on our behalf for in words that you know don't we don't understand or moanings we don't even comprehend. He does it in a way that's peculiar and particular to himself and to heaven as well as to the circumstances there. Now people might try to tell me that you know it's some heavenly language but no, that's not what the Bible says. The heavenly language of the words and the gift of tongues and all that stuff is another subject, but it's not applicable to, you know, supposed heavenly languages or angelic beings, you know. That's not what is said there. But the way that God operates by His Holy Spirit is the means with which He's able to communicate and to make personal the reality of God. And that's what we do when we are interceding. We are acting on behalf of another person. We're becoming a goel or a go-between or a person like a parakletos that comes between or beside someone to help. We become even likened unto all aspects of God by way of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Because you see, on the one hand, we're asking that something be done. We're hoping and helping that person to come to a place of knowing God in a more intimate way. Because no matter what they pray for, or what they ask for, part of that is the realization that they're going to he who is greater than they are. So they're coming to a better knowledge of their relationship with God, so you're helping them to know that, which is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is one aspect of the Spirit of God, to cause people to come to the Father. Also, because Jesus is our High Priest, we're acting on behalf of that person, because Jesus is in us, we are acting in behalf of the priesthood that we've been given. The Melchizedek, you know, the Melchizedek, as you would say. The priesthood that is greater than the one that was established by the law, which was Aaronic, or after Aaron and after the commandments of God, by setting up a priesthood that would intercede on behalf of just covering sin. But rather, we're dealing with one that is spiritual, that is going into the very heart of the matter. That we become as intercessors, likened unto our high priest, who can enter into the Holy of Holies, we all then are high priests after that order. So we intercede in that way. 
when we go before God to ask on behalf of someone else. And as laying our life down and our time down to do that, to no longer be ourselves, but to be there for the person, we become like Jesus. So there's a great mystery, which really is a magnificent unveiling of just what powerful experience prayer could be, if <laughs> you really want to know. Which is always kind of fun because God will reveal all that you want to know. The Father said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who abradeth not, but give it to all men liberally. And because we have these promises and assurances, we're told not only that we could know, but we could completely comprehend it if we would go after it with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and strength. Not just a question of, oh, well, I read it, you know, and I got everything out of it. You know, you could read it 10,000 times, not get everything out of it. Because the way the Holy Spirit operates with diverse manners and particular personifications of his application of the way that he puts it inside of your life and he applies it to your particular comprehension within the parameters of your ability to see, understand, and make applicable in your life as you are reading it at that particular time and space where you are as you are relating to him in the way that you are. Only the Holy Spirit can give you that little measure of it. So that guess what? The next time you read it, it is different because so are you. And the only person that could make that real, <laughs> it's great, is the Spirit of God. So you can't say you know it because you don't. Because you only have what you've been given. And the way you get it is from God. So it's as you are relating to him in that moment that you know as much as you know. And that's all you know. Because it may be that when you're reading it at the point in time that you are, you go... Well, I didn't see that. Wow. And then you get a broader, bigger, more encompassing picture of who, what, where, how, and why God is, what he is, as he is, being called, he is, or I am. I am that I am. To my people I shall be what I shall be. And in knowing that, then, it opens up, literally, some, some of our brain cells start firing on all all cylinders because we only use a small portion of our brain and then we start expanding that and it starts getting wow you start seeing things in a different light you start experiencing things in a different spirit you start knowing things in a different way and the reason is simple because God has suddenly begun to fill and overflow out of you his personality <laughs> as opposed to your own. So he becomes one with you and you become the personification of him. And that's what it meant by when Jesus said, I pray that they may be one as you and I are one, Father. And likewise, when First John said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. And he that hath the Son hath life, and he has not the Son of God hath not life, for God is in you, both to do and to will of his good pleasure. What a joy that is when you get a chance to then step out of yourself and into the work of God to do what God wants to do for someone else. And that's what we call, in one area of this work, intercessory prayer. And so in my utmost, which... Because I lost my book, I had to find this other one, which is in modern-day version. So the language for me is modern. <laughs> We're reading today intercessory prayer. Shock. Surprise. Men ought always to pray and not lose heart. Luke 18.1 You cannot truly intercede through prayer if you do not believe in the reality of redemption. Redemption is always fun to hear someone try to explain it because they usually talk about what's done for them rather than what the process actually is. To redeem something is just like layaway. You could call it a Kmart, you know, that you went down to Kmart and you saw on the shelf you. You saw a little Cupid doll of you. Now, pretend you're not you. And this getting confusing? You are you or you you. The Cupid dolls you. So you're not. <laughs> so 
God walks into Kmart one day and he says, Hey, you know what? I like that little Cupid doll. That Cupid doll, that, that's Michael. That's me. That's you. You know, that's kind of a nice little Cupid doll. It's a little bob head, you know, kind of goes and it bobs around, you know. And so God says, I want that Cupid doll for myself. So I'm going to put it on layaway. So he puts a down payment on it. He puts a earnest money to say, I'm going to pay for it. So then he gives it to the layaway clerk. And the layaway clerk says, okay, well, you know, you got to make payments regularly. And I'll cover this. He says, tell you what, I don't really want to make payments. I want to pay for it all right now. But I don't want to pick it up until later. Could you deliver it? And the clerk says, well, yeah, we could ship it. Is that good? And he says, sure, ship it to my house. So then he says, but I'm going to go away for a while. So, you know. I'm going to have a delayed shipping program or I'm just going to ship it, you know, and have you ship it to me and then just leave it on the porch. Well, God, when he puts down that money and pays for you, is redemption. That is the money that's being put down. He hasn't redeemed you yet, but he's already paid for you. Now, when he comes home and he takes you out of the package that you're in, that shipping package, that flesh that you're in, then he's going to bring you inside the house and you will be fully sanctified and restored unto the full redemption that he has purchased for you, which is really what redemption is. <laughs> Was that simple? Mm, no. Okay. Okay. Instead, you will simply be turning intercession into useless sympathy for others, which will serve only to increase their contentment they have for remaining out of touch with God. So let's start that one over again so we understand why we have to be in touch with redemption in order for them to understand the reality of intercession. You cannot truly intercede through prayer if you do not believe in the reality of redemption. Instead, you will simply be turning intercession into useless sympathy for others. You feel bad for them, so you pray for them. And instead, you will serve only to increase the contentment they have for remaining out of touch with God. In other words, if intercession doesn't include for the person that's praying the knowledge of God, then guess what? Their prayers, of course, can't be answered. Of course, you can't intercede for them because they have to be in the knowledge of what you are interceding for is not just an answer to the prayer, but the knowledge of God himself as he answers prayer. The realization that God is alive, that God is living, and that God does meet them where they need and has promised to do so always by fulfilling in them the reality of his presence, which meets all their needs. That's what it means that you have to understand the reality of redemption in intercession. It's the interjection and intervention of God himself in a person's life. When you intervene for someone, you want God to meet them, not you to answer their prayer. You don't want to be the recipient of the glory that, you know, oh, thank you for praying for me. God answered my prayer. No, you say, no, I had nothing to do with it. God revealed himself and spoke and gave a word for you to pray and for you to receive and that God allowed me to participate in that, seeing you receive from him what he wanted for you all along. You don't need me, you need him. And so intercession becomes a union with that person to bring them to the realization that they too are high priests. They too can have the promise of God in their life. They too can know the fullness of God as you do if you were interceding for them. The true intercession involves bringing the person or the circumstances that seems to be crashing in on you before God until you are changed by his attitude for that person or circumstance. Identification of what Jesus did with us becoming sin for us was the reality of how he could be one with us because even on the cross he became sin for us. So much so that the father said, ah, and he couldn't look. And the son said, Father, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so in identification, when you intercede, you become the same. The circumstances as, as you pray and as you 
become one with the person as you recognize the things that God is doing in the both of you as you intercede causes you to know by way of His Spirit what to pray, but also you feel their pain. You bring upon yourself their agony of sorrow or joy or whatever intercession and need that they have that you are praying for. You must be one with them. Or it is, after all, just simply agreement with feeling sorry for someone rather than being agonized by that and at one with them in the spirit, the soul, the mind, and the heart. Until you are changed by his attitude toward that person or circumstance, because intercession means to fill up with what is lacking in the affliction of Christ, from Colossians 1.24. To fill up is to be made aware of and to complete that which Jesus has identified with each and every one of us, knowing that by his stripes we are healed, he has known sorrow, he has been afflicted as we are, he was a man called the Son of Man, that we should be able to identify with us, being God himself, he made himself as a man, that we would be one with him, and he would be one with us. So, bringing up and to fill up what is lacking in the affliction of Christ is to identify with the person that you're praying with. You're not higher or lower, greater or lesser. You are equal with that person in need, for even as the grace that you receive, you're extending grace to that person. Even by the same mercy you received, you're extending mercy. It is the love that has unified you with that person in intercession. And because of Colossians 1.24, this is precisely why there are so few real intercessors. Oh, there are many that pray. There are many that ask, there are many that plead, there are many that cry. But how many die for the person they pray for? People describe intercession by saying it is putting yourself in someone else's place. That is not true. The intercession is putting yourself in God's place. It is having His mind and His perspective. It is being Jesus by identification in His salvation as He hung on the cross for humanity for all of the world to save them. And in intercession, the same is true as you identify yourself with the person to give them to God and say, forgive them for their sins. So in the reality of intercession, there is that salvation being made aware of. As even so, all that you don't know will be revealed as you do know what to pray for by the Spirit of God in you, as you are led, filled, and identified with God and you and them being one. For you cannot hide that which is obvious, and you cannot be blinded to that which you see. Because if the tender heart of God was able to reach out from the cross and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, we likewise, irregardless of the person we pray for, can do the same. As an intercessor, be careful not to seek too much information from God regarding the situation you are praying about because you may be overwhelmed. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> if you know too much, more than God has ordained for you to know, you can't pray. The circumstances of the people become so overpowering that you are no longer able to get to the underlying truth. You don't hear what God is saying about the underlying facts. You only hear what the person is telling you of the circumstances of what they are in. The fact of what God is saying is always greater than the circumstances of what the person thinks, feels, or understands from their comprehension. Our work is to be in such close contact with God that we may have His mind about everything. But we shirk that responsibility by substituting doing for interceding. It is not always right to say and to meet the need of the person, but often it is absolute to commit it to God for him to respond as he chooses. And yet intercession is the only thing that has no drawbacks because it keeps our relationship completely open with God. In real intercession it does. In religious observation of a dogma of interceding 
then it doesn't. But we must avoid an intercession is praying for someone to simply be patched up. We must pray that the person completely threw into contact with the very life of God, the very presence of God, the very knowledge of Jesus himself living and alive in them. And if that means to continue on with them, then you intercede in actuality of a living with them in a completeness till they are restored as well as prayed for. Think of the number of people God has brought across our path only to see us drop them by the wayside. When we pray on the basis of redemption, God creates something he can create in no other than through intercessory prayer. So the reality of often what people take for granted is more often than not always lessened by the observation of what we see other people doing that God himself has not brought us to the complete realization of what he means by intercession. So it's good to learn but never stop learning. It's good to study, but never stop learning. It's good to know, but never think you've arrived. Because if you do, then you're going to fail in the realization that there is more to a subject. No matter what it may be, whether it be intercession, whether it be redemption, whether it be salvation, whether it be Jesus, whether it be God. At any point in time, the Holy Spirit can choose to open your mind and the you would say the eyes of your understanding, but open your mind and connect the dots in a greater way, dependent upon what your circumstances are and what he wants to do, so that you'll discover there's always more to everything you're learning. That God is so much greater when he said that the heavens are as high above the earth, so too are his ways above our ways and his knowledge above our understanding that we can't even come close to the comprehension of what he is doing, much less what he has in store for us. So always be open to expansion of what God is, what God does, what God has said, and how God wants to apply it. Always be open to that. Remember, open to that expansion of your mind, not to encompass other things that are lower, but to expand upward to the outward reaches of our comprehension because we are finite and the infinite is seeking to bring us to an understanding at that moment of some point of contact that he wants to meet with us. That is how the infinite touches the finite or the infinite, the finite. <laughs> or the infinite to the finite. <laughs> but that's how God interjects, interrelates, interposes himself in us to reveal to us himself. And that's what intercession really is. It is a revelation of huh, God himself.